But okay. So welcome again to all who are here in person and welcome to the guests online. Just to make you know, we were now on a tour at NEST. We have seen a lot of things on sustainable construction and we will now have four inputs which go a little bit deeper, give a little bit more background. And just to start, for those who were not here at the very beginning, if someone has a problem to be on the picture, please let our people know it because we will use some of the pictures for social media and for our internal communication too. So accelerating the transition to net zero building is the theme of today's meeting, gathering, workshop. And we do it together with Holtzim. Again, thanks a lot to host and collaborate with us in this context. And for me, and probably for many of you who are not specialists in the field, this tour through NEST was really a learning experience. And I always say that's one of the privileges if you are working at the Young Global Compact Network, you meet so many companies and you see so many different things. It's really fascinating. For you online, but also for you now in the upcoming 40 minutes, more or less, we will have inputs. Please write down your questions, comments, and then we really open up. The idea is that we sit here in front. I will moderate. I have some questions prepared, but I hope that you will bring in a lot of questions. The idea is really that we learn from those on the panel, but also among each other. Don't make speeches of five minutes, but you can also make short statements of one minute and then we will give you some answers and discussions. Before I give the word to Philip Block, I would like to set the frame. Why we as Union Global Compact are we doing these kind of things? We have launched the Tour de Suisse on sustainable business in 2016 in Geneva. No, 18, sorry, in 2018 in Geneva. And we will go on. We were interrupted by COVID, obviously. So we did some online events, many online events. But it's also the occasion to really exchange, to know each other, to network on specific topics. For those who do not know, I ask, who, who does not know Young Global Compact? Some of you, I will very shortly, for most of you are members, participants. There, were some, there are some friends from the World Business Council here, which is one of our partner. I say always they are the big, small brother because you are really the network of the largest big transnationals. Holcim is also part of it, if I'm right, Nestle and so. And we are a mixture of all kinds of very large to very small and micro enterprises. We have a clear mandate from the UN General Assembly to create markets with a human face as stated by Kofi Annan at the WEF in, 20, in, uh, in 2000. 1999, sorry, and we were uh, mandated by the UN General Assembly in 2000 to build up a network. Today we have some 17,000 businesses worldwide in some 120 countries. We are 70 more or less, 71 now local networks. We as Swiss Liechtenstein network, we are covering these two countries. Companies who subscribe to the UN Global Compact say we want to engage and implement along the whole value chain, the 10 principles. And Kofi Annan said, let's create we, the UN and you, the private sector, a global pop compact of shared values and principles to create the market, markets with a human face. They just picked, and that was quite clever, the four main pillars, the four main conventions of the UN, 
the Human Rights Convention, the International Labour Norm Convention, the Ecological Agenda Paris, Paris, plus 20, uh, Paris 2030 now, and the anti-corruption principles. That was the start. And in between, we have added the whole approach of the sustainable development goals, because we also ask that you implement these principles into your strategies and your operations and in your culture everywhere. It sounds very simple, but a company like Holtzim and others know what it means. If you go into your value chain, your supply chain, distribution chain, it very fast gets very complex. In between, we have developed together with other actors like the World Business Council in Switzerland. We work closely also with OPU. We work together with B Labs, with Clean Tech, and others to really create ecosystems where the business partners, the private sector, take up their responsibilities. And to be honest, I'm also a bit proud. We had this discussion last week with SDC and Swiss, um, Swiss Holdings. The private sector was the first one who picked up really the sustainable development goals in the debate before even most of the NGOs and much before the, uh, the Swiss federal administration. So we were forerunners, but we were also accused to do SDG or greenwashing, and that's still a risk we are in. So what we see now is we are locking behind the agenda 2030 if we take all the analysis and in switzerland also and the conflict and the war in ukraine will probably push us even more back that means that we as private sector and that's our call to all of us are even more called to really take that serious and do whatever we can do this Slide shows a little bit what Paul Polman, our vice chair and former CEO of Unilever, always repeats. We have not only to get net zero, we have to get net positive. And if we are honest, we are somewhere close to the middle for the very advanced companies, but we can't say that we have a regenerating economy yet. The question is do we reach the climate? ambitions we have, are we really able to stabilize our ecosystem in the long run for our grand grandchildren? And the ambition we are pushing forward together with you is that we get there as soon as possible. So what we want is that, I don't know whether it works. Yeah, let's take, I always say we need two steps. The first one is implement the 10 principles. That's the ABC of decent, responsible business. Hmm? Human rights, labor, environment. The two steps do no harm. And then look where you're very strong and further develop that. And we are asking you, our participants, our members, to give your know-how back into the network. That's what's happening to today. So this is an occasion and an opportunity that others learn from you and you learn from others. And the second step is then look where you can make a difference to the agenda 2030. But first step, make a do no harm analysis. Where do you, do you have a negative impact? And we do have negative impacts on SDGs, that's evident. And then reduce them to a maximum formulate your strategies along that, and then go and say, and where can we make a difference? I always say the sustainable development goals are probably the best business opportunity we have in the 21st century, because it's the first time in human history that all the states, even if they don't follow it, but they formally agreed that these are the main challenges we are facing as global human society. And we want to tackle and really change that and create a world we want, as we say in the UN. So with that, I finish. That's what we want from you. Drive impact on specific goals. 
scale collective action and make measurable progress to that last point, just a remark we will have next week with Novartis, an event in Basel on measurement of impact of the real economy, not of the finance, econ uh, finance sector, but how can we measure the real impact we have in the mid and long term. There we are also at the beginning. One example is the value balancing alliance. So in case you're interested, there is still space. So our joint ambition is this, making global goals, local business. And with that, I now hand over to you, Philip. Philip Block, you have all met him already on the turn for those online. He is professor at the ETH Zurich Institute of Technology and Architecture. You are also head of the Block Research Group. Yes. And you are also member of the board of Holtzim. And with this, I just hand over to you, to your slides, please. Thank, take that away. thank you, Antonio. Thank you also for the opportunity. Indeed, I was lucky that I get two slots. You could uh, visit me in the Hilo. And now I can, uh, what I want to do is zoom out a little bit and talk about the uh, potential impact. Um, Um, so uh, what I specifically want to share is what you can achieve uh, through design and how important actually rethinking design is, but also um, uh, how important it is to understand what a material wants to do, how a material wants to be used and so on. And so that hopefully we can indeed get to a more nuanced discourse on sustainability. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I consider concrete, not reinforced concrete, but concrete as an artificial stone. A stone is happy in compression, and that is where these uh, historic geometries that indeed are many still standing after centuries uh, still work. And as I showed you earlier, but for those of, of, online then for the first time, by just reintroducing these uh, first principle good structural geometries, this is exactly what you get. So rather than forcing a material to be in a geometry that it doesn't want to be, and hence all the additional material and reinforcement needed, you get this for free by just going back to how we used to build. 70% of reduction on the concrete volume and 90% on the steel. So we developed this into this floor plate that you've seen. So for us, an important milestone that we could demonstrate these kind of numbers here in Hilo. Uh, so as I said, we are talking about only three centimeters of unreinforced concrete uh, stiffened to take all loading cases to the supports in compression. But as I promised, I want to now zoom out what the impact could be. So this is not my image of the future, but this is just an image of a reality, a reality that we're densifying, that we're building taller, this medium high rise, so 10 to 30 story buildings is a prime typology that we have to address. If you look at these buildings, and we do a quick case study. So let's say that we replace our typical floor slabs with the system that you have just uh, learned about uh, that we now built here in Hilo. So let's take a 25 story building. If you were to replace it with the floor slabs that we are now developing, the Ripman floor slabs, then uh, we are using those two aspects. Uh, I didn't talk about this yet, but this is why I focus on this super banal, boring element. The, the thing we walk on is because they are the most material intensive uh, product in these medium high rises. That's the bottleneck, how to spend space. More than 40% on a medium high rise. And if you go taller, it's even, even 50 to 60% of the material is in the floor slabs. So we use then the, uh, the benefits that we have. You see it's not 70, 90, because it depends on the fire ratings. For medium high rises, we need two hour fire ratings. So we have a small correction. So if you use that for this one building, you would save 7,500 cubic meters of concrete, um, which if this sounds maybe a bit abstract, it would mean that more than 1,200 concrete trucks would not have to go to this one building site, this one building, but you also save more than 20 kilometers of reinforcement steel per floor, or if you nicely roll it out, and this might be a coincidence, then you, you can go all the way from Zurich, where I live and work, to Brussels, where I'm proudly from. So that is so you get these two advantages at the same time. But what really matters is not the volumes. It's actually this equation I like that I adopted from Catherine the Wolf. Uh, the greenhouse uh, uh, global warming potential can be seen. You, Many people focus on reducing mass, right? So that's one part. 
but you also want to reduce the impact of the materials that you use. So this embodied carbon coefficient. And then lastly, and this was more recently added, is of course you want to consider the, the lifespan of, of uh, your resources, of your impact. So that is the last one, by the way, is where circularity comes in, right? Because what is best is to extend the lifetime that you never have to build again, uh, that you can use recycled aggregates, that you can re reuse uh, uh, components, that you, uh, and so on and so on. That's where circularity allows you to extend the cycle indeed. So um, as, a, as an example, to clarify that it's important to not just focus on material innovation, but that uh, how much you can get through better design. And so uh, better design, I uh, call in this specific case of reintroducing the vaulted geometries, strength through geometry, you, you see that you're, sorry, sorry. You see that you're actually getting two aspects at the same time, a significant a significant reduction in volume, but also a reduction in stresses. And if you have lesser stress in your material, you can use a lower strength material, which has a significantly larger impact. And then on top of that, you can use all the state-of-the-art developments and they're rapidly development, uh, developing of uh, the industry's replacements of the clinker content and all the, the typical things you can do to improve the material. So that means that all of these three aspects uh, give you this reduction, then you still have a bit of the steel. So that means that today what you've seen is something, in fact, that's not correct. This is the one designed for a medium high rise. So what you've seen is only uh, uh, 12% uh, uh, of the equivalent greenhouse ga gas emissions of your typical floor plate, right? So that is what we can do today with certified materials with just introducing these new kind of uh, ideas. So some, some of you were asking about the real numbers, right? So these are the real numbers, the real comparisons. So we are developing this floor plate for eight by eight meter floor spans, which are typical kind of office grids and so on. And you see how well we're doing. But those of you who look at this more carefully might notice that we are doing an unfair comparison because I'm talking about using a material how it wants to be used. So spanning eight meter spans with timber is a bad idea. So let's compare then the reasonable spans in timber. So this is then a timber solution for a five by five meter grid. And also there you see that we are at 70% or less. I'm happy to go through these numbers with you. What you do notice, by the way, is that I'm not taking all the carbon absorbing in the, in the timber because these timber solutions are highly engineered, don't have a clear end of life strategy. So they will be released into the atmosphere at a certain point again. So uh, that is why we are de developing this. We're developing this at a discrete prefab system as we discussed in the unit when you visited. The important thing there is that we have full clean reusability. We use the masonry logic again to have dry connections, no glued connections, separation of materials. So we don't jeopardize easy dust free, low energy recycling and so on and so on. So this is uh, seven minutes exactly now. So that's good that I'm at my last slide. Um, there is this estimation, it was done by Bill Gates, that we need to build the equivalent of 200 billion square meters to offer adequate housing, not here, but at all the people in developing kind of context uh, for the growing population. And considering again, that 40 to 60% of the mass of all these buildings is in the floor plate. That is why I'm so excited to show you actually how important it is to actually challenge the status quo of design and, and construction uh, uh, in our industry. So with that, thank you for listening. Perfect. Thank you very much. Philip, for those online, if you have already questions, you can write them in the chat, in the discussion. Sabine will then feed them in. But now, it's good. I go on and I hand over to Magali Anderson, probably I don't have to present you very much, but yeah, you already said what you are. Uh, I got it right, you are also member of the management board of Holzim. Did I get that right? Or Correct. You? So in my, committee, yes. in my knowledge, you are the first and only sustainability responsible chief in the board and the only woman, at least in Switzerland. So possibly. 
I when, think so. When I got named two years ago, there were we were very few, but there's more and more of us, okay, which is actually good. a good thing. A good development. <laughs> I hand over to you, please. Now, it's a good thing because I think um, to say hi to the people online, the others, I've now seen you twice already. Um, it's a good thing because I think that putting sustainability at the heart of the decision making of any company is the only way forward, is the only way to actually move things. But let's talk about here we are. So I just want to um, say a few things. Am I allowed to move because of the people online or am I supposed to stay yeah, here? You can a little bit. Way, not <laughs> okay, so I just wanted to go through the, the mega trend because I think to understand the challenge that we have today, the societal challenge, we need to go through that. And the mega trend, basically, what they are saying is I will focus on the second one. There's about 2.5 billion people who are going to move to urban area in the next 30 years. And that means that 60% uh, of that infrastructure that doesn't exist today need to be built. And that's about building New York City on a monthly basis for the next 30 years. It also means that we need to keep the current building, that 80% of the current stock of building we have will, will still exist in 2050. So we need renovation. And, and that's what it means that um, when, what you just heard from uh, Philip is we just can't continue building the way we've been building. It's absolutely critical that uh, we rethink the way we built, and I will focus on circular economy, which has been so big focus. But before that, just in two minutes, for people who would not know, hold sim. Um, so we are a big company in uh, 70,000 employees, 60 countries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The rest I will talk about it a bit later. Why it's important is because when I will talk to you about net zero. It's not net zero in Switzerland or in Europe where maybe we have some nice uh, uh, legal framework that accompanies us in that journey. It's net zero across the entire company, across all geographies. And our net zero target that we took, so we, we had a net zero pledge a year and a half ago, and um, that's what came out end of October where SBTI, Science-Based Target Initiative, which we consider as one of the most reliable scientific organization to validate a company's target, SBTI validated the net zero target to seven companies. To my knowledge, I haven't done any since, um, both on the three scope, but also on short-term target 2030 and 2050 target. And it's all about, you see efficiency gains in design and construction efficiency gains is an important part of the strategy. And that's what Philip just showed. Uh, for scope two, we need a bit of decarbonization of electricity. And then we need uh, less, cement, less clinker and cement, less CO2 in clinker. I explained that a little bit during the tour. Sorry for the people online. I, if I spend time explaining that again, I would be in trouble with Antonio because I will be over the seven minutes. And then the big blue part that you see here is carbon capture usage and storage. But the reason it's shaded is because that's also innovation. And what we are saying is that we know what to do for the next 10 years very well. We have our plans per plant, per country, everything else using traditional lever that have allowed us to reduce our CO2 by 29% since 1990 already. After that, we will need some CCUS. How much will depend on how much innovation we can make. And that's why for us innovation is so important because the more innovation we do, the less CCUS we have to do. Um, and circular economy is completely at the heart of everything we do. We have to basically build more with less. If we want to build New York City every month from now on, we just need to build it with much less material than we are doing it today. And, um, and one of them is design. And I think you can recognize what you have seen today on, on that picture. It's about making buildings last longer, but it's about recycling and recycling when I look at it, we, I look at all the waste we use. So at the company we use today, as I was mentioning in the small group, 54 million tons of, uh, of waste, and we have a target to go to 100 million tons. But the one that really interests me the most, that is uh, the best usage of waste, 
is the what we call CDW construction dimension waste. So think about it. We make cement. With that cement, we make concrete. With that concrete, we make a house or, or anything. And that house at the end of life, I destroy it, grind it back and put it back in my cement. And that's as circular as it gets. And I can do that indefinitely, forever. Concrete is indefinitely recyclable. Today, we are doing it. We are doing Susteno in, uh, in Switzerland. Um, and the reason why we are doing it in Switzerland and not in other countries, because that's the only country where the norms allows it, the norms will be expanded to the rest of Europe by the end of this year. And the good thing is we have been now testing it enough in Switzerland, so we will be ready to do it. But in terms of usage of the old stock, so when I look at the old building myself, I look at it as a, as a stock of material. I don't look at it as a waste, that's the contrary, that's a resource. So we will be ready. But it will require, and it's one of the questions I had in the small group of how do I make sure it's not contaminated, et cetera. So it will require quite a lot of um, crushing technology, digitalization, et cetera. 3D printing, when I talk about rethinking how we built, 3D printing has a, a, a key role to play. It's really about reducing mass that um, Philip talked so much about. And we can do it with CDW, so we can use waste uh, recycled concrete to do 3D printing. What you see on the picture here is the foot of a windmill. Not only I am using, for the case of the windmill, I think it's about 50% less material. I'm going higher, which means for the same windmill, I actually get more 25% more electricity out. And if you look at the energy transition that everybody has to go through, concrete has a key role to play. But again, if we think on how we build differently, but 3D printing also allows me to buy, um, to buy, sorry, to build schools in Malawi, to build um, affordable houses in, uh, in Africa, where there's a shortage of about 1.2 billion houses today. There's a shortage of 50,000, sorry, 40,000 classes in Malawi today. And we can completely close this type of societal gap much, much faster than with traditional methodology. But that also requires uh, a lot of innovation. That one in my, in my case, I don't know how many we have female doing at the X code doing innovation and uh, sustainability. Antonio, maybe you can look at that as well as a, as a thing. That's why it's so important to put innovation together. Today, 80% of our innovation effort goes to sustainability. 65% of our IP goes to sustainability. But more importantly, is all the startups ecosystem. We truly think that the, the solution is not unique and will not only come from us. And we work with a lot of startups. We just started this week, the third season of our accelerator. I am personally mentoring a bunch of startups. It just keeps me young. But I think, uh, and I advise anybody to do that, by the way, that's a fantastic thing to do. It's really something that um, we have to do. We work with, we have a partnership with academics, including the one we've been talking about with Philip. This is really uh, challenging us, but pushing us to, to push the frontiers. And uh, it's my last slide, Antonio, I finish. <laughs> um, so it's really, I want whole sim. we are the biggest material construction company, but we want to be the disruptor of the industry. So we want that agility. And some of the things we are working on, that project here, we are, we want to launch it in 2022, 100% recycled concrete. So for people who know a bit about concrete, it's not so much the concrete that is hard to make, it's the cement. That means 100% recycled cement. And we will have that commercialized this year. Um, 3D printing, I already talked about it. That's, we are, we are partner with Cobot on that. And the thing I didn't talk about it today because I didn't have time, but the a topic I'm passionate about is if we truly want, have to build, not that we want, we have to build uh, New York City every month, then we need to reconcile nature and the city. And this is where we have products like Hydrobedia, where we do um, urban forests and we beat urban heat island effect, which is all about, I want to see cities with urban forests, with the vertical forests, with roof forests, and that's what we are working on today in innovation. Thank you. I think I was a little bit over, sorry. Magali, no, that's good. I just hand over to Roland, please come up. Uh, Roland, your director built environment for, for of 
at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development based in Geneva. Please, the word is yours. Thank you, Antonio. I'm a very fortunate person because I work with people like Magali and your company. WBCSD, we have 200, over 200 global companies in our network. Um, and our focus is on sustainability. How do we help our members become net zero, nature positive, and also reduce inequality? We help them work across their value chains to change the way the market takes up these sustainable solutions. And we're also trying, working on, um, giving more sustainable companies a lower cost of capital. So that's the whole question of engaging the capital markets and actually rewarding sustainability. So it's a big job and it's a very rewarding job. Thanks to uh, people like you, Magali and Ryan. And I have my whole team here. So thank you. Um, today, I'd like to briefly take a step back and look at these urbanization trends and just see where do we need to get and the urgency of us getting there. And we discussed so many great things today around innovation. How do we scale them much faster so that we can really drive that? So the first message is the built environment is 40% of energy related greenhouse gas or in absolute numbers, because we have to talk absolute numbers, 13 gigatons every year that goes out. Now, why is it such a big number? Because we're looking as well as at the materials in the construction, in the production and then construction, but obviously the energy consumption. In our session today, we're mainly looking at all the material innovations, but obviously the built environment um, is responsible for over 50% of electricity consumption. And hence you can see um, almost nine gigatons is buildings consuming energy. And we need to get to net zero over the whole life cycle by 2050. And looking back at what the science tell us, science-based targets, we need to have all emissions by 2030. So that is a massive task. And it basically means new buildings should be net zero in operation by 2030. So any building that is being designed, constructed as of today should reach these goals and it should massively reduce that so-called embodied carbon, upfront carbon. And I think Philippe, you have given a great um, illustration, we have to do this in a performance based way. So not picking one material over another, but really how do we drive that on a performance basis. So the task is massive. What we have worked on as WBCSD is understanding this as a system, because this is not about one company doing it. This is about all companies in the value chain working together. And you can see here in the middle what we understand by that value chain. It's obviously those who make the materials construct put it into a development process, and then you have the users, that's the blue circle. But then you have all the, the so-called influencers and the architecture and engineering community is a massive influencer, the developers, and then ultimately the investors. And I'm very pleased that Sasha will speak after me because you will give us that, um, that view. So we need to involve all these actors have a common language of what we need to achieve. We need to look at all the emissions and really how do we get to net zero across the full life cycle on a performance-based report. I wanna have a quick look at that bottom diagram, which is really the, the technical part, is how do we measure all these emissions? We call this whole life carbon emissions. Now, I think I'm here talking to a, an audience that is well uh, aware, but we're still not doing it enough. Um, we need to look at all that goes into a building and we discussed during the tour, it's not just the materials embodied carbon up front. every 20 years we're replacing stuff. So we need to look at everything that goes into buildings and we need to look along those cycles of the life until end of life. And we don't know yet how, very well how to treat the beyond life. That's why here it's outside of the summary uh, box you have on the bottom right, but this needs to go down to net zero. So that's um, a framework we have put out. Then again, our privilege to work with great companies. So Arup have joined WBCSD two years ago, global engineering firm. They said, well, we're doing this. So let us put out our numbers and show what needs to be done. And it took them nine months to create six case studies. So the message was they thought they were doing it. Um, and they're very open about it. They don't mind me saying this here. Um, they're saying that themselves, that really 
they need to, I'm sorry, how do I go back? They need to do this. And the call is to all firms. We have to start doing this. We have to measure this whole life carbon. And we, something we discussed in the break, we have to start sharing much more openly. Um, some of the designs we've seen today, the numbers we see, well, how do we share all these things much more openly? And also we have to start setting very clear targets. There have to be absolute targets um, that we actually get to net zero. In our next step, and Veronica, Luca, the team are working on that uh, with, with the members is how low can we go? We want to understand, and we learned a tremendous deal today, how low can we go today? There are no excuses for us to actually push that boundary as much as we can. And we believe that such a common language, common system can really help us, that we do it the same way, we measure it the same way, and we can compare. And then lastly, um, we're working as part of a global alliance for buildings and construction. Again, Holtem, you're also part of this. Many companies are also part of this, where we're working not only with business, but with many other stakeholders, especially governments, but also cities, civil society under the Global Alliance for Buildings. And we went to Glasgow last year with a common voice. So we were very happy that we were many global organizations together. Sorry, I'm pressing something. Saying, look, we have this common vision. So two enablers of what we call this market transformation that needs to happen is having that common vision together. The next thing we need is that deep collaboration. That means sharing information, sharing stuff, and really working together. Um, and what we call levers is what, whether you're a business, a finance player, a government, whoever you are, these are three things we all need to look at. Again, whole life carbon, the message from uh, before, but then also how do we start integrating that into decision making. If we just have a carbon number, but we're not looking at it, it will not start driving the decisions. So we really, and some companies are doing it. We have Swissery here in the room, who is Vincent, who is starting to look at putting carbon price. I hope I don't put you here on the spot, but these are forward looking companies who are starting to look at how do our decisions change if we actually put the carbon next to the cost? Because we wouldn't build without knowing the cost, but we still build without knowing that <clears throat> carbon. And that will help us then transform the dynamic because what we're saying is that ultimately we can only transform this built environment system if it's the demand side. So the demand side being us as end users, being companies who need their own assets, um, that they start demanding better outcomes. And that's when we can start seeing this innovation here really come to the fore. That's my hope, and I'd love to discuss that more, um, how, we, how we accelerate together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Roland. Thanks, Roland. And now I hand over to Sasha Cesar, um, Director, Sustainability Manager of the bank Jafra Sarazin in Zurich, also one of our participants for a long time. You will bring another perspective. Please, the word is yours. Thank you very much, Antonio. Pleasure to be here. Uh, my, the, do you hear me? Yes. My focus, uh, uh, my input will focus on the topic of climate action and decarbonization from the perspective of a sustainable investor. Our sustainability journey actually started uh, over 30 years ago, and uh, we have been among the uh, co-founders of the UN Principles for Responsible Investing, Prince, UN Principles for Responsible Banking, and are also a member of UN Global Compact and uh, report against the principles annually. Um, so uh, with this slide, I just wanted to kind of reiterate, reiterate where we are right now. Um, the CO2 uh, concentration in the atmosphere is the, at the highest level uh, in entire history, human history, actually. It's over 420 parts per million, uh, mainly caused due to human uh, activity burning fossil fuels. Uh, as a result, global warming is uh, at more than 1.25 degrees Celsius. Uh, as I see the push uh, uh, notifications, actually, it's pushing very closely and dangerously close towards 1.5 degrees. As a result, we see continuous heat re uh, records and, uh, and a number of um, uh, sort of... Um, 
uh, impacts of climate change, of course. And the problem is that we still have a very large ambition gap by 2030, when we look at uh, what the current policies are, what the current pledges are. Um, so we are actually still far off of the 1.5 degree target and are sort of aiming at 1.8 or 2.7 degrees Celsius. So the problem is basically that uh, COP26 did not deliver. And yes, we can look at uh, uh, COP27 and the next, um, and the next uh, climate change conference in Cairo. Uh, later this year. However, uh, much more needs to happen actually, and not only regarding the pledges, but also regarding the implementation. How does the financial sector then uh, react to this? There's already a lot of movement in place. Glasgow was already mentioned. Uh, a large alliance of financial institutions came together and pledged their portfolios to uh, uh, achieve net zero by 2050 or sooner. So insurance companies, banks, asset managers, um, uh, as, or asset owners as well, uh, have basically pledged a, a very large amount of their portfolios to uh, sort of achieving net zero by 2050 or sooner. We are among one of those in initiatives, the Net Zero Asset Managers Initiatives, as an example. So something is happening, uh, but clearly there's not enough. However, we not only have pledged actually to achieve net zero, and not by 2050, but by 2035 for assets under management, now stable asset management. And this is basically the decarbonization pathway. Here, we, we don't distinguish between our investee companies and investment portfolios, but this also, this also applies to real estate. And um, so, and, and with our decarbonization uh, sort of uh, methodology that is displayed here, uh, we want to kind of half emissions uh, by 50% until 2030. However, um, you know, so we're not only pledging, but also implementing this. Uh, we have pledged 100% of our assets. Uh, we implemented this already for 90%, 19% of our assets. So we're continuously working on this. However, the challenge is uh, when we look at real estate, I think um, we can achieve net zero for operational carbon. Uh, that's what we pledged. However, the challenge is clearly looking at the entire life cycle. So uh, upfront carbon was mentioned, end of life was also mentioned. Uh, carbon storage is another topic. Um, and I think across this entire balance, we should uh, try to aim for net zero by 2050 or sooner um, across the entire life cycle. And um, apologies, I have to say, it's not only going to be concrete, but biogenic um, materials will have to be part of the system and part of the solution. And I'm very much inspired by the things that I have seen in less two dates. Uh, very, uh, very nice to see that actually now being, actu uh, being built. And um, another thing that I wanted to mention, we are actually also an active owner. This is just an example of a, um, an engagement that we actually did. We had a conversation with Holzim as, a, as an investor. Uh, where we learned about their uh, climate targets. Why Holzim? Well, clearly um, uh, the cement sector accounts for 7% of the global CO2 emissions. Holzim is Swiss-based and actually one of the largest uh, cement manufacturer. And uh, I commend what Holzim has done with their climate targets until 2030 and working on the climate targets until 2050. However, uh, we would encourage Holzim to do actually even more and, uh, and the entire sector actually has to move. And I think that's the biggest challenge that we have to achieve. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sasha. Please take a seat directly. I ask the four panelists to come up here. I think, yeah, we can have that or you just put this. That's perfect. We turn it off. So now to you. Huh? Uh, I wonder, I have questions and I have a moderated process, but if you have questions or comments just don't hesitate to lift up your hands and get in um, okay let's start before i go in the moderation i will give you the word immediately but i would come back what you were saying roland it's about how did you formulate it i've just just to check wait a second it's about decision making are we fast enough in decision making? I would ask you for now in the debate to think about it. And Sasha, you were saying Holzim does a good job. I'm exaggerating. Are they doing enough? Do we really reach the net zero by 2050 with these steps? And then turn it positive the other way around. 
okay, let's accelerate. We are on the right path. How can we improve? That would be for me now the debate to start. But first, is there a micro? You had a micro uh, a question. Yeah, you have to take the micro because people okay. online will not see it. Thank you. So uh, yeah, I'd like to come back to you the, the last uh, the last point and the, all these initiatives ongoing. But it, if I look at the Asset Owner Alliance and we are part of that, we are co-founding. You know, the Asset Owner Alliance have not yet even put the embodied carbon on on the plate. Uh, so how can we be fast enough and discussing, uh, you know, reducing the disembodied carbon by 40% if even the, the most advanced still are reluctant to, to put it on the plate for discussion for working on. Thank you. I would hand before, I, before you switch over, I would really go and ask Magali, you're one of the large companies I suppose I'm also asset owner of Holzin through my pension fund. <laughs> and it's exactly the question we had here. Yeah, you are invested by many other people. You have done a lot of change in decision making. I've observed that in the last seven years and I have seen a huge shift, but is it fast enough? What do you think? No, I mean, it's clearly not fast enough now. Having said that, we are the leader in our sector. So we were the first ones. Uh, we've been trailblazers for, for some years now. So, but that's not good enough either. Um, but what I look at, the way I look at it is uh, to make sustainability sustainable, it has to work for everybody. And unfortunately, companies cannot be charity companies. They also have to make, to please all their stakeholders including the people. And I, I never like to say it's someone else's fault because I don't think it's the right thing to do. And what we have seen at the COP26 is a lot of companies are actually pushing and going forward without waiting for the legal framework. And that's what we have done by putting our uh, net zero concrete, sorry, it's not net zero yet, our net zero roadmap and our low carbon concrete on the market. We have done all of that. But what we clearly see is that in countries and regions where the legislative framework is incentivizing us, we progress much faster. So today, that's why I insisted on the fact that our um, target are global, because in Europe, we are not sharing publicly the, the numbers uh, per region. But in Europe, we are way, way better than most of the regions in the world because of the ETS system that is in place. So today, one number I can share is that when I was talking about replacing fossil fuels by waste, in Europe, we are above 60%. When at group level, we are 20%. So that's telling how you can accelerate. Yeah. And that's the, the view of the operational industry. Roland, you wanted to comment on that also? Yeah, just... <clears throat> You know, you asked about decision making and, and, and let's be clear, um, we haven't looked at this issue of whole life carbon since a very long time. The World Green Building Council issued a first report two and a half years ago on embodied carbon. Um, so I think we are all still discovering the full life cycle and it's starting to sink in. And But everybody also agrees that it's ultimately the investor community, the finance community, that is the biggest accelerator next to policy and regulation. So I, I mean, ultimately everybody has to come up mm -hmm. to the same level, but, and one good news, I, I can share it here, although it's maybe not official yet, but we are engaging the Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance. They want to learn about embodied carbon and whole life carbon. So we're actually going to work together. So it, you can really see more and more collaboration is starting to happen. So that's the investment side. That's the operational side. Philip, you have presented us a lot of new, of innovative things. And to be honest, for me, it was a big discovery. I didn't realize. I mean, I have seen that when I studied archaeology in Jerusalem 25, no, 30 years ago, how the Romans built their arches and they didn't need any cement. They just stood up huge temples and you were showing us a little bit the same direction, go back to old techniques and make them sustainable. So in addition, what you have presented, where do you think we have to speed up to innovate? And there was also this 
you were saying it, we have to call, no Roland, you have said we have to collaborate. Where do you want the private sector to move? Um, well, I mean, there is, there is maybe an issue which I, I, I clearly focus on, on construction and there is these extremely long timelines and it's, it's, uh, we're, we're for sure not going to get there if we are now building things with knowledge of four, four to eight years ago. So if, whatever we can do to break these kind of cycles and that have also to do with risk, with whatever, um, uh, that, that would help us already far, uh, uh, going much further. But I want to give maybe uh, uh, the example of timber construction. I find it extremely surprising how fast now suddenly all over the world, everything is starting to become possible in timber. So it is possible to suddenly accelerate and so on. And, and I use the example of timber because it's actually probably pushing us in the wrong direction. Uh, and, and one of the key things that I wanted to say, and I'm happy that you acknowledge this, Roland, is that we need to start also to look at performance criteria and, and go beyond, for example, getting stuck in a naive material discourse on sustainability. It's, uh, I, I try to argue it's how you use materials. Uh, you have to really understand the true bottom line, uh, line and, and developing objective frameworks that address this will really help us with that. Because I, what I see now is that we are also stuck in more kind of an, an attitude of taking sustainability as a business advantage opportunity by architects, by investors, by and so on. And, and, Current, current frameworks seem to make people happy, but in the global scale, I, I, I haven't calculated this, but intuitively I'm quite convinced that it's going in the other direction because of greenwashing, concrete shaming, and so on. So it's, uh, and another aspect of that, which I've then witnessed with the other hats that you disclosed indeed, uh, uh, being an ideological academic on the board of Holzim, I also see how uh, uh, what happens on a, on a global scale and so on. And for example, witnessing that EH, ESG uh, ratings and, and pressures and so on, they push actually very responsible com companies to get rid of more dirty parts of their portfolio uh, in order to hit short-term ESG kind of uh, Rating. So again, I'm afraid that currently the, the, the attitude of sustainability and the, the very non-nuanced and naive kind of uh, uh, approach to sustainability is, is, is not, not getting us there at all. So I'm very happy to see that there is a lot of progress in, in objective frameworks that actually focus on what really matters. And that is when you take everything together at the end. So there was a bit too long. You said to make no, 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 one no. minute statements. Yes. No, no, no. But I, I, I don't know if there are reactions because what I observe, we can also build up sustainable sustainability ideologies where we can get into a tunnel and get blind. Uh, and that is one of the big challenges that we are awake and may even question all the time our approaches. Is it really the right way? And that's why I like your provocation. Timber, wood, I, before I discussed with you this last week, I thought I will build a house only in wood. I'm not sure anymore after the discussion with you. To be, to be honest, because there are other aspects in it. So can, can I quickly, because please? you should build in wood that makes a lot of sense for a house locally here in Switzerland. That doesn't make sense if, because it looks green, you want to build a mega tower in China, for example. Okay. So it, it's that how you use the materials, right? So before I build, I will come and ask you. <laughs> <laughs> so please, yeah. again, now, yeah, open up. Can I... First you and then Simon. A super quick remark. I think also the labels and so on are beyond. So, you know, Minigy and, and LEED and so on, they also do not take these super long-term future criteria properly in account. So we get super happy if we have a LEED platinum building, but this is nowhere in, in the term of, of net zero. So just for reflection, this is not enough. We need really to think of those important long-term KPIs. So that means we need even more innovation. Huh? Probably we are only at the more science, more innovation. We are still at the beginning because what I observed that the financial sector was shifting within three years, four years, very fast. I've never seen that before. 
And now the real economy, some companies were ahead, some are locking behind, but the whole thing is moving. And now we have to be careful not to go just on ideological paths, but be very critical. And that's probably for us here in the room who are working in the field to be very critical there. Holger, you wanted to say something? No, uh, Simon, Simon, yeah, he is here. <laughs> Raise your hand, it helps a lot. <laughs> yeah, Simon, please. All right. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for, for hosting us here, Holzim. Um, I saw you have about 70% or so on, on carbon reduction beyond 2030 until 2050, which depends heavily that you pointed out on innovation. So my question was, and you pointed out so many things that you're, that you're sponsoring, how much of your revenue in percentage do you dedicate to that? Because I think also the finance people in here would, would be interested to see where their money goes. So I'm not sure um, what your question actually means. If you are looking at how much we spend in R&D, that's one way to look at it. But I would also look at how much we spend in hitting the ground and running right now because we don't want to wait for 2030. So the reduction we have to 2030. So I will give the example. So R&D, I did not answer the question, is about 250, 300 million. But for me, what is even more important, um, if we want to win that race is to run now. And we have deployed Ecopat, which is our green concrete um, global ranch. We have it now in 24 market. We, we launched it less than two years ago. Last month, it made more than 10% of our sales. So, so the, the, for me, pushing our green product and to be called EcoPact, you need to be minimum 30% less CO2 than the country level. So that's, we get SGS validating it, no greenwashing there. Um, we also have EcoPlanet on the cement side. So I think for me, I look at it as a two speed thing, what we do now. And that's why, yes, we need innovation, but we need it, we have 10 years to get there. In the meantime, Deploying a compact everything everywhere is where I put my money at the moment. Absolutely, I agree. There's both things we need to do, right? So running to 30, but also building the pathway from 30 to 50. Probably you're not going to be there anymore. I'm not going to be there anymore. No, no. So, so the other part of the th of the thing on innovation, which I did not mention much, is that we have 30 pilots in CCUS. And we are not disclosing the numbers we put in those pilot because it's quite touchy. A lot of people would like to know that number. It's not a public number. But we have 30 pilots in CCUS because we realize how critical carbon capture is going to be for us in 10 years. And so, so with a lot of the innovation is a thing we can do today and the thing we can do in the future. Let me, yeah, please, yeah, you, you go. So um, thank you for the nice presentations from all of you. Um, I have a question, I think, for all of you. Um, who is, in your opinion, responsible for the upfront embodied CO2 emissions, also for the uh, operational emissions and of life waste in a new building project right now? Is it the end user? Is it the owner or the investor? Is it the architect or the engineer? How Philip uh, pointed out, engineer has a big role here to reduce it. Or is it the material manufacturer? or the energy producer and so on. Yeah, I wanted exactly to go in the, in the same direction. What is the supply chain? What are your clients? What is the balance there, Roland, please? It's a shared responsibility. That would be my answer. Obviously, each player is looking at their part. So if you're a developer, you have scope ones, two and three. Um, and that would typically include materials as well. For a construction company too but if you're an investor and i that question i have to hand over to sasha it may not be part of your scope three but if you look across your financed portfolio you start measuring it as well and now you can say we're starting to double count but that's not a problem as long as we're looking at it in a system so if anything sasha finances hits certain targets that will also help Holtzim achieve its goals that are sitting on its books. So it's, it's a shared responsibility and each one sees a part of it. But may I add a question here and I hand over directly to you because we have to change also the approaches of architects of, how do you say that in English, general unternehmer. So uh, prescriptors, yes. architects. prescriptors, the public sector, uh, that's one of the big issues with, where the sensibility, even with a law, is not there. 
do you have from your side possibilities to influence decisions or is that taking over the responsibility of others that's also one of the questions how far can we impose to people that they have to do certain things but sasha please to you there's many uh, topics to unpack but I, I want to kind of to underline the topic that that's a shared responsibility and i wouldn't lay blame on uh, one individual stakeholder um i think we all have to do our part uh, and and i want to stress it it can't just be one particular material but it has to be uh, many different materials that we have to utilize the right materials the right place um uh, and uh, there's a lot of con consideration that has to go into that and in my view um to answer your question a bit um label can certainly uh, play an important role. There are a number of uh, building construction labels in Switzerland um, in place already. Um, only a small or sort of uh, part of that do consider embodied carbon um, uh, and assess it actually at the construction. Um, uh, I think that will be certainly something that will have to be encouraged more. I think in the past, the focus was too much on energy and not on carbon. Uh, now we sort of looked at carbon, but now we have to expand the picture a bit uh, further and everyone should look at uh, whole life carbon, right? Um, uh, and I think this will be something that uh, labels ha will have to look at more, uh, but the labels are only in a way uh, guidance, right? So if, if you are not uh, perhaps uh, knowledgeable about these topics, you typically would look at what the guidance uh, Guy, uh, labels prescribe and then actually try to build on that but you can uh, also mandate you know uh, construction projects uh, and or different stakeholders in the value chain on, of uh, when realizing construction projects what you would like to have whether it's a, a timber construction building or uh, other type of material and the thing is uh, or what whatever type of project right and and goals you would like to achieve the problem is that we should try to kind of move away from uh, utilizing conventional materials and basically uh, you know building as we did in the past i don't know 20 30 40 50 years and i think that's a mind shift that has to take place but exactly this mind shift in my personal experience to be honest if i'm speaking with the big companies with you follow here i have the impression it's moving but i had not long ago, a meeting with the Lions Club in Zursee with these small entrepreneurs, and I was presenting these approaches. And then were two one who has a, a, a company for gardening, and the other one in, in metal, metal uh, work. So, as typical SMEs with some 20 to 30 people. And they told me, You can tell us, but at the end, it's always the price who decides when I make a, a proposal even to a hospital in a in, in a Swiss canton at the end it was the foreigner who got it and not the local one who proposed better materials how do we change and influence that and maybe we open that up because my question is what can we do as networks world business council global compact you guys to really bring these ideas we have seen this afternoon on a broader and uh, faster path but the, so the price is not only it's not the only thing to, to start with if you look at the cost of concrete in a full building it's like five percent of the cost so even if you increase it a bit the impact will not be that large and i think to say that no one will pay the price um raise of hand who buys mainly organic food every day okay so you guys you are quite happy to pay 10, 20, 30 percent more for your food every day and your budget at the end of the month. How much is that costing you? Are you crazy? You see what I mean? So I don't think it's really the problem. I think the problem lies in several things. First of all, we don't explain enough to the people that actually wouldn't cost that much to decarbonize their construction. But the other side of the coin is to say, well, we can actually do it without necessarily a price increase because what did Philip show you? And you, I'm, I'm surprised that maybe you were going to ask this question that no one is asking me, how can you have at your board someone who is telling everybody I can build with much less concrete when I'm a concrete <laughs> maker? Are we crazy? We are a bit. Because that's what I mean when I say we need to rethink the sector. Today, I sell cubic meter of concrete. I don't want to sell cubic meter of concrete. I want to sell a finished system where I put, put much less concrete, but still get well paid. So if I go and, and, and see you and tell you, okay, now you are going to buy this house that you are going to pay 100, 
you still pay it 100, but I put less half the concrete I was going to put in it. I can sell a much better concrete. I can protect my margin. You will be happy. The construction company will be happy because you will be my more concrete. Maybe take a bit of the margin out, so maybe we can share. And the planet will be super happy. So I think it's, it's a wrong way to look at it, to just look at straight impact of price. We have to completely redesign the model and legal can help us, but it's also us working together that have to do that. We don't necessarily wait, need to wait for the legal framework to change to do that. Yeah, Roland, you wanted yeah, to intervene and then yeah. well, I'm fully convinced, but at the same time, I have the same question as, as you, Antonio. Why isn't it happening more? And I think you mentioned the general on Tunemung, that there is a key part of the value chain that is, I don't know if someone from Implenia is here before I say something wrong, but <laughs> it's a part of the value chain that has um, some of the lowest R&D spending and lowest innovation. And, and maybe Philippe, you can talk more about that. So there's very little innovation in the very moment where everything needs to come together. So we're talking here about holistic solutions, but mm -hmm. I think there is a challenge and I don't quite have the answer today. How do we break that? And it's a lot of small and medium enterprises. Yeah. In plenty already are big in Switzerland, so they're doing advanced things, but I'm not sure this building here next door is using the innovation just from here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, no, but, it, but it's, it's an example. We're still struggling. Yeah. I, I we're guess it's We're struggling, but like we said, things have changed a lot the last two, three years. Sorry, I jumped in, but I just wanted to, to give a very quick answer. Today, my clients, not maybe the small one, but the mid-sized bigger ones, they, most of them are starting to take a scope three target. Okay. My scope one is their scope three. So their interest of putting less concrete, but finding a good deal to do it so that I am interested works. So that, that um, nice value chain is starting to happen. Okay. And, and I think we shouldn't look at the past five years or 10 years in terms of acceleration to predict the future. As you said, the things have changed incredibly in the last two years. I expect those change to happen exponentially myself, but I am an optimistic person. <laughs> yeah, to, I think that the scope free aspect is an important one because here you are downstream and upstream and smaller companies are in responsibility because you as a big company want to know how big the impact the, eco the ecological footprint is, we are uh, advoc advocating for the social scope free emissions in parenthesis. That's the discussion we will have next week at, at uh, Novartis in Basel, because we are convinced if the forerunners are sensibilizing their upstream and downstream clients, things will change much faster. That's also one reason we say, hey, Big companies ask your suppliers and your clients to become part of a sustainability framework, either EBU, either World Business Council, Global Compact, because then things start to move. And I see many SMEs now coming to us day after day. We have difficulties to follow up. Things are definitely changing. Sasha? Uh, perhaps two things that I wanted to mention. Um, uh, one regarding the price discussion earlier. Which price are we talking about? The price where all externalities are sort of included or just the current market price? And I think it's clearly not the one with the externalities considered. And the other aspect regarding scope three, just to make the round, because that was mentioned regarding the asset owner lines. Um, I think a number of these uh, initiatives actually do encourage to uh, phase in uh, scope uh, three emissions uh, on the investment side. Our climate targets I mentioned earlier uh, for our sort of target uh, net zero target for 2035 for investments is currently on scope one and two emissions of investee companies and real estate. However, uh, our pledge includes also phasing in uh, scope three emissions. Once that is done, the picture clearly will be very different because there is maybe some very efficient companies in, in sectors that have huge externalities, um, namely energy sector, for instance, or material sector, right? And then uh, this will uh, clearly change again and uh, cause a lot of dynamic. However, I think we can also talk about data challenges um, in, in the real estate sector regarding you know, uh, embodied carbon data, um, in the investment sector regarding scope three uh, data. Uh, I acknowledge all that, uh, yes. However, I think there's already enough or good enough data there, some, some modeled with which we can already work. That's your step-by-step. -step. 
to progress step by step. Uh, I'm looking at my points and uh, at the clock, I would have ma many more things to debate. I want to come to one last point afterwards we would like to discuss, but you wanted to, to make a remark again. Yeah, and sorry to take the stage too much, but uh, uh, we had this discussion of who is in charge, who do need to take responsibility, and I'm a little bit, everyone, yes, but <coughs> one which is super important is the one who make the comment who says, I'd like to have that. And this is a little bit the point that is still a little bit difficult. If the vision, you know, I want a building with <coughs> a good uh, sustainability status, whatever it is, but this is missing. We don't command or, uh, or, or yeah, uh, uh, request things with the right KPIs. So World Business Council uh, for Sustainability Development says, Minus 40% on, on embodied, that's the target. Who, you know, make the first step uh, at telling, uh, we'll make a, a competition and says to the, um, to the architects, you know, <coughs> thousand workplace, two, 200 millions uh, and minus 40%. We, we really need to do that at the very beginning at the vision at the vision point yeah i mean that's a, it's an important point we probably can't go to the end real estate companies who are building or investing in larger constructions infrastructure public sector will be important there philip you want to react i know that is exactly where it starts that's that's the the most important thing in my opinion indeed uh, but then you also have to follow up and so meaning that you you have to kind of uh, reset your expectations. If, for example, if you say I want that target, but I want all the flexibility of all my neighboring buildings, and I don't want to go, so that is one aspect. If you say I want that target, and uh, you use the, the SEI recommended kind of percentages of uh, how much an architect will be paid, no, it takes a lot of effort up front to design something that disrupts, that changes, and so on. So then you, you need to be willing to also invest in that. Um, and then to, to your comment, there's so many, so there is norms that are calculated wrongly somehow that don't give actually flexibility to put more upfront uh, to actually solve problems later on. There is also legal frameworks that don't allow you actually to come together earlier, or for example, that you need to do an open tender for a public building of who is a contractor. So no contractor is interested in really being part or it's just not feasible. But if you have that disconnect then you design for the worst case, because any contractor will then uh, make uh, try to make as much money as possible with whatever design and so on and so on. So there's so many, where to start somehow. And so there is a lot, but I think like you say, it needs to come with a will first, but also an attitude shift. Uh, uh, and architects also need to not just then say like, yes, 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 we'll deliver all of that. No, the, the, the teams need to then insist like, but this is a consequence. And, and uh, I talked with some of you uh, during the break, I noticed a very different attitude in very different parts of the world. Like for example, when I work in India and, and South Africa, then they ask us what are the constraints because they have to hit low cost. They know they, they are talking about sustainability and they don't want to do the same mistakes that we make. And they're willing to start from constraints. Here today's clients are not willing to start from constraints. They're starting with, we want all our notions that we're used to today, but those are often not compatible. Sorry, that was maybe a bit too long. No, 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 okay. that's, I mean, it's always important to, to finish with a positive, encouraging approach. And my question also for me, myself, and for you and our network is, what can we positively influence? What I definitely see, we have a challenge on the side of those who order infrastructure, buildings, etc. Though that means we should also probably enlarge principles for responsible management education to architectural schools. Because the formation and sensibilization is a big part. We probably should enlarge that also to investment. There it's happening. And maybe we have to look what we are doing as big companies in our supply and distribution change. Are we really helping our suppliers and our clients to discover that there could be other solutions? What I was proposing to two guys, I was mentioning these SMEs. I said, yeah, 
why don't you offer your garden in free price categories, very sustainable, high quality, plus social quality and ecological quality, mid range and low range. And then the client has to choose. But normally the architects, don't take me wrong, but my impression is that they just often have an idea and they will choose the cheapest way to sell it. Is that the right way? Can we change this? I don't want to offend any architect. There are architects who do the opposite, I know. But uh, I had this big debate when I built my first house. I had to impose to the architect that he is doing it in, in ecological terms. But that's 20 years ago. Um, I'm originally an architect, so um, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> but no offense taken. Um, I think when I, I studied architecture, I had to, uh, I was fortunate to have teachers where sustainability uh, and sustainable construction was a very important topic. Um, uh, I was also fortunate to spend a number of years at ETH Zurich where uh, this topic has clearly uh, evolved a lot uh, with uh, yourself and, and many others working on this topic and actually advancing solutions. Um, I would say the education nowadays is much different to uh, compared mm. to when I studied uh, architecture. Um, and I think uh, to the defense of the architects uh, topic is very present. Okay. And there's a lot of initiatives already bottom up uh, uh, kind of, you know, where they would like to actually more contribute towards climate targets. And I think in the end, we actually have to uh, sort of take everyone uh, on this journey, right? It's, it's not, again, a shared responsibility. We have to do this together. And I would like to, to share maybe just one small anecdote on a construction project uh, I had with a, a general contractor uh, where we discussed the possibility to um, ap uh, apply um, uh, recycled concrete right um, uh, with the uh, aspect of you know uh, uh, stored carbon and then he was like yeah yeah I, I, I see perhaps the benefit uh, I have some uh, questions about you know the applicability uh, but I don't really think the market is there at the time I didn't really know what to answer but today my answer would be we are the market right so basically it's mm -hmm. our will to implement it Okay, I think that's the, the thing. I don't know if you have other ideas, because uh, that is the struggle, because we are all a little bit impatient. We want to make move the things much faster. When I hear Paul Polman telling us, you, the private sector, you have to become net positive by 2050, that's mandatory. Say, so how do we reach that? And as you say, Sasha, it's really collaborating and sensibilizing and things are moving fast. Who said it on the tour? It's five years ago, these kind of reflections were not yet there. And five years is a very short time. So there is a lot of hope and that you are here is also a good, a very important sign that we want to change something together. So probably it's also on each and every one of us to be aware of it. But the other side, what I learned today is don't close, don't be in a tunnel and don't believe everything. I always tell my students the first thing in my lectures, I'm teaching business ethics is don't believe what I'm telling you. Uh, and I think that's that's an important part also. But, but believe what I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> Just to finish, you allow me three minutes more and then we go to the closing and to the operorish. We didn't speak really about the regulatory frameworks. We could spend an hour on it, I suppose. But I would still ask because we wanted to have more politicians here in the room. We didn't get them. Uh, not, I mean, there are constraints, etc. But I think there needs to be done more in awareness raising in parliaments, in cantonal parliaments, and the national parliament. What is your experience, or what are your expectations to regulators, to governments, and to parliamentarians? And we all can influence our parliamentarians. We elect. Any ideas just no, to finish? Uh, I think there's quite a, quite a few things. So in Switzerland, for example, landfilling is more or less forbidden, which is fantastic, but it's not the case in most other countries. And we saw a lot of how circular economy is a great factor there. When landfilling is cheaper, it doesn't work. CO2 price is absolutely necessary. But one um, another one I would put is I think today, Norms are extremely important. I would be the last one to ever say norms are not important. But I think innovation is going at such a speed that there is a bit of a disconnect of the evolution of the norms versus innovation. 
and that we could accelerate a lot of things if you know if norms could um, evolve at the speed of innovation thinking a new reality one of your people said i remember we should think a new reality and go in this direction yeah i would actually just mention um uh, if we look at the regulatory development um there is a lot of things happening, especially in the EU, um, especially in the sustainable finance sector. Uh, regulation is moving incredibly fast compared to a number of years ago. Um, I would argue perhaps Switzerland is a bit uh, lacking in behind, um, uh, but there will be some, uh, I suppose, some response in Switzerland as well, but it does affect many financial institutions in Switzerland. Um, uh, and that's, you know, in, in the end, it goes about the investments, what type of investments do we have, etc. Um, one important note I want to kind of mention, and I think um, in Switzerland here, we can move a bit uh, faster in that sense. Um, our norms are uh, luckily actually very, very principle based um, and very lean compared to perhaps yeah. other countries. Uh, that's a benefit. Nevertheless, I think in my view, and I would actually say a lot of my colleagues uh, in sustainable construction, sustainable real estate and sustainable investment share this opinion uh, that we should consider uh, focus more on carbon and clearly whole life carbon. And this will have to be kind of then reflected by a, the norms and the label uh, landscape in Switzerland, because that will clearly also move the construction. Yes. Uh, it's really, it okay. was already mentioned. I, I... I think uh, Switzerland is lucky indeed compared to the uh, Euro codes and so on that are much more, uh, are not principle based, but pres uh, prescriptive. Pres prescriptive. And um, yeah, that, that hinders innovation indeed. And so we, 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 we need to do everything we can to not hinder innovation. But I also do think that a bit more pressure from governments in however this is done, uh, this, will, this will tip over the costs of things, right? So the Pricing in the externalities, that is still a big debate. And the question is how we do that exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, we are over time already. <laughs> I look to, to you. Is there a last question or a last comment? Yeah, please. Yeah, the micro over yeah, there. And coming. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent uh, discussion today. I, I just wanted to build on the point of regulation. Um, I, uh, from my limited understanding of this world, I understand that there is so many different standards. And so perhaps this question goes more to you, Roland. Uh, how is there a way uh, you see harmonization of different reporting standards? You know, you have the TCFD and the CDPs, um, the IIRC, IASB, and, and so you know, as a, as a company, when you start your sustainability journey and you want to report, you, you come across this huge maze of frameworks and, and you know, it's a time consuming, cost intensive exercise. So um, how do you see this evolution happening in the, in the coming, uh, let's say five years? Do you see a standardized framework evolving at some point of time? And um, I mean, how do you think that would impact you know, the prospects of greenwashing and, and you know, the, the fact that some companies are able to get away with reporting uh, in a, in a non-standardized way. Yeah, I think, again, at a high level, there is a lot going on and that kind of harmonization attempt is accelerating. So you mentioned the TCFD, for example, there is now a new initiative on TNFD. So what does it mean, nature? Uh, related financial disclosure, and also the recent um, uh, founding of the ISSB, the International Sustainability Standards Board, if I'm not mistaken. So there are attempts because indeed ESG today is a, is a mixed salad. There's very little correlation between the different ESG systems and hence for a corporate, it's almost impossible to, to already react to all that. So I think there is, there is a lot moving uh, in this area. I don't think we will ever have a fully harmonized system, but maybe a bit like IFRS and GAP, they have some joint principles and then they have some things that are different. I do think the taxonomy in, in Europe is definitely something that it's, it's not perfect now, it may never be. So there's still a lot of debate how that can evolve, but it will definitely have an impact also outside uh, of, of Europe. So I think these things are speaking to each other. We do see some more collaboration starting to happen. So also that space is 
starting to realize we need to collaborate radically uh, rather than compete. Yeah, but the reporting will probably stay a challenge in the next years. That's what we hear from all our participants, members, that you have to respond to several standards. And maybe, and we are hoping that we will have, a, as we have more or less an international bookkeeping standard or bookkeeping standards, that we will have similar things for sustainability, ecological and social approaches. That's the idea, but also there, not only in construction materials, we are in a process and in, at the beginning. And if you have good ideas or also critical questions we should work on, probably the World Business Council as well as we and other organizations, we are most happy to pick that up. If there is not an absolute need, I would like to come to a conclusion because we spent now, what, nearly three hours together. I hope you have learned something in these three hours. I definitely did. And I would like to thank all of you for your participation, for your contributions. I would like to thank Nest for the contributions and the opportunity to be here and our technicians over there who facilitated that, the team of Holtzim, Sabine and her team, we were working now, what, more than one year old again and again to, to put that up. Uh, thanks a lot. And also my team is sitting over there be, behind there. Without them doing all this work in the background, these kind of activities wouldn't be possible. What I wish to you and to us is that we take from this day, not only information, but also the courage to go on to even more work together, to be critical in approaches. I think that's a very important part to question our beliefs and then further de develop it. And I see a lot of faces with whom I had online meetings in the last two years more or less meetings. I hope we can meet in person more in the upcoming months. If you have suggestions, desires, we could organize jointly with you, with other companies, with other actors in our networks, because we did also quite a bit with World Business Council already. I would be most happy to receive them. And thus said, I wish you now on the tables, our speakers will be there. So take the opportunity to, to ask questions, to be still in contact and in dialogue. And there is some very good food outside. Thanks a lot and see you soon. And for you, I have a little gift afterwards. Bye-bye. <laughs> good afternoon. <laughs>